हेलो एंड वेलकम आई एम गौहर रजा एंड यू आर वॉचिंग योर एक्का हु कुड इमेजिन अबाउट फिफ्टी इयर्स बैक दैट मेटलर्जी विल बी यूजिंग बायोलॉजी और समबडी हु इज ट्रेन इन बायोलॉजी वुड बी वर्किंग इन नैनो टेक्नोलॉजी वेलकम डॉक्टर किशोर पाकनेकर टू राज्यसभा चैनल वी आर वेरी ऑनर टू हैव यू एट अ चैनल थैंकफुल दैट यू गिव टाइम टू योर एक्का लेट्स गो बैक टू योर चाइल्डहुड यू हैव गिवन ऑल द क्रेडिट फॉर योर इंटरेस्ट इन साइंस एट प्राइमरी स्कूल लेवल to your mother how much was the contribution of the larger family or the school um as i told my mother was the primary source of inspiration for me because she taught me science right from my first standard till i was almost uh, up to ssc level and actually she is a graduate uh, in science from in botany and i was inspired by her teaching uh, in the school because she was a school teacher for some time and then she uh, left that job uh, for the for the family reason and uh, then she used to teach me science in in house and uh, she was an excellent teacher do you remember some of the role models that developed during those times yes when uh, you read the books yeah i was fascinated by people uh, like uh, not not ex- exactly from science but people like shivaji maharaj and shivaji maharaj in the idol is an idol in uh, in maharashtra every child loves him of course him. yeah and he is uh, an ideal leader but you are yeah. equally uh, fascinated by personalities like fine men yes i i read about uh, people like edison uh, then jonas salk and later on in with fine men and i was fascinated by their biographies but you have taken name of uh, physicists not biologists Yes, uh, Jonas Salk is a biologist, of course. Jonah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, but otherwise, uh, I I always liked science and particularly physics and biology, and that was I think quite strange because people either like physics and mathematics, and they are not they are allergic to biology or it's vice versa. But I liked uh, subjects like physics and biology equally. Equally. Why didn't you take physics? Um, I was scared of mathematics. <laughs> some uh I like physics more than mathematics. Do you remember some teachers who inspired you? I was inspired by uh, Professor Arvind Akte who was our microbiology teacher in Abha Sahib Garhwari College in Pune. And I was uh, really under uh, his influence. He was an excellent teacher and in many respects he was ahead of time. so that is why you decided to do your phd yeah. in microbiology yes yes and i did phd with him uh, in a field called uh, geo microbiology uh, or sometimes called as metal microbe interactions so will you say that it was influence of mother and your teacher who made you a scientist yes and your interest was sustained in research yes. Yes. over a period of time yes. why did you choose a particular problem of phd uh because uh, that was the field uh, which my uh, supervisor dr akte he, he was practicing for quite some time and i was fascinated by the subject because it was, it was kind of a interdisciplinary subject between at the inter, at the interface of geology you always liked inter always i liked geo interdisciplinary subjects which bordered, bordered between yes. uh yes. biology and maybe and engineering physical sciences, physical sciences. Yes. and you moved very swiftly from one yes, discipline so it was, uh, to another discipline it was very easy for me did you train yourself in physics continuously because you had interest in physics yeah actually in college uh, as you know uh, after you passed 12th standard uh, during my time there were two distinct streams either you take a stream or b stream a stream was always with physics chemistry mathematics and people you normally went for engineering uh, do, uh, with a stream Right. and b stream was bar for biology and then ultimately you go for medicine and i had to choose the b stream because uh, i was kind straight of straight jacketed walls straight jacketed which walls. you couldn't cross yes uh, and in in my college uh, i uh, talked to my principal that can i 
or for physics along with microbiology. And uh, that permission was not, not given. So I studied physics on my own, actually, out of interest. And you excelled in physics. Yes. You still like... And I still like the subject. And therefore you shifted to... We'll come to that. Yes, um, yes. But I have to take a break. Hmm. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back soon. Welcome back. Uh, we were discussing that your interest in science was sustained because of the mother and because of your teachers. But there were turning points yes. in your life, mainly three turning points. Would you like to tell us something about Yeah, the first turning point is the, when I was still pursuing my PhD. And uh, at that time, I got an opportunity to get a train uh, in the erstwhile USSR and Bulgaria. Uh, this was a training course sponsored by the United Nations Environment Program. And they selected participants from all over the globe. And this was a school almost running for four months on a special subject called uh, microbial leaching of metals from ores. This is the period when the scientific community across the world has mm -hmm. realized that each discipline can learn from the other discipline and maybe come up with new solutions to yes. the problems. Yes. And that is when yes. you were benefited. Yes, and uh, I got uh, trained, uh, hands-on training in this uh, area, practically uh, at, in the lab scale, also at the mine scale, because this was a very exhaustive training program. And I met uh, very good international contacts at that time because the faculty was drawn from across the globe. What was so special about this leaching? Uh, this technology at that time uh, was... Uh, being propagated for a possible uh, environment-friendly technology. Because at that time, people realized that the uh, good quality uh, ores are depleting very fast. So it won't be possible to extract metals from uh, using normal technology, what we call as pyrometallurgy. And because the metal content was going down the very pyro fast. The yeah. is mainly chemical process through which you extract the minerals. Yes. Right. It's a physical, I mean, you can heat, you have to smelt the metal. Yeah. And, you dissolve yeah. and then you heat and yeah. then you extract yes. iron or copper or nickel right. or whatever right. is the material. Yeah. So what was so different about... The different thing was that um, uh, big, uh, it was realized that Whenever a metal has sulfur or iron, you can use a class of bacteria called sulfur and iron oxidizers. And these sulfur and iron oxidizers, actually, the food is for them is sulfur and iron. And uh, they generate... They eat up, they sulfur, eat up sulfur and, and iron. iron. That is the energy source. And they produce a lot of sulfuric acid as a waste product. And in the sulfuric acid, the, whatever metal is present in the ore gets dissolved and comes out. This is called as leaching. And since it's a microbial process, it was called as bioleaching. And uh, these sort of commercial scale plants have come up all over the world, especially in the United States, Canada, uh, South Africa, and also in Russia. And you don't uh, increase the carbon footprint when you use this technology. Yes. That is a major advantage. Yes, yes. So if I understand correctly, then bacteria eat the metal that you are interested in. From Bac the ore. Bacteria eat sulfur and iron yeah. and produce sulfuric acid. Right. And then separates the metal yes. from the ore. Yes. And then you can extract this ore from whatever is left. Yes. Right. Which also means that you have to pump a lot of bacteria into uh, the area where the ore exists. Yes. yes. Uh, what happens is these bacteria are naturally present in the ores. Only you have to create conditions where which are favorable for the multiplication of bacteria. And once that process... But that's a very difficult and slow process. Yes, bacterial multiplication is uh, a little slow. But once it starts, it, uh, you, you start getting metals on a continuous scale. In fact, the, uh, all the big operations which are going on... So almost on, bacteria ki kheti karni padti hai. Bilkul, bilkul. Right, if yes. I understand correctly. Yes. Yes. That you have to harvest bacteria, then take it to the right kind of place where the ore exists, and then you Spray pump. them. They actually, this, op this uh, operation is on a scale of a very big scale, actually. Uh, it's usually in the form of dumps, very big dumps, 
on which the bacteria are spread using sprinkler systems. So, as, as the bacteria percolate down, they will oxidize the iron, oxidize the sulfur, produce sulfuric acid and also leach out the metal. But then this sulfuric acid can also leak and contaminate the area. Yes, in fact, uh, that is always a problem in the sulfuric mining areas. This is called as a big problem of acid mine drainage. So, in fact, if you use this sulfuric acid, because naturally also bacteria are growing, they are producing sulfuric acid. So, if you use this process for extracting metals, then in fact you are lessening the pollution. In India, we are a very mineral rich country. And we extract a lot of uh, minerals in various areas, it's spread over very large areas. And we export most of it as it is. So, do you think that this process is going to help also in later on value addition? It will become cheaper and simpler uh, and environmentally clean technology and also value addition at later stage? In fact, now it has become more relevant to India to use this technology because we have already depleted our rich mineral reserves. So, whatever we have is either waste ores or very low quality ores. So, from this low grade or low quality ores, it will be very difficult to extract metals economically. So, you will have to use a process which is cheap, which, is, which runs almost free of cost because bacteria will dissolve the metal and they don't charge any money uh, for extracting these metals. Right. They don't go on strike. So, <laughs> these are the advantages. The only problem is uh, that the process is slow. So, but if there is no alternative, this becomes the best process. To use. We can also extract nuclear minerals through this process. Is it advantageous? Yes. There? In, in principle, uh, practically metal, many uh, metals can be done, including, uh, including uranium. In case of uranium, the process is slightly different. Uh, it is oxidation of uranium so that it becomes soluble in water. And that, are, that also is being practiced uh, at many places. So, do you think that India should focus and pump in more money to develop these technologies in-house and without basic and fundamental research, you cannot achieve these technologies? Absolutely, absolutely. It is necessary to pump in this. Uh, Are we doing sufficient work in this area? Uh, at one time, a lot of work has been done, but unfortunately, at that point, uh, point of time, it was much easier to extract metals by conventional technologies. So, although this, this bioleaching technology was developed to a certain extent, it has not really reached commercial stage. But now, I think this is a time where we again, we should As a nation, we revitalize should our interest. Yeah. Focus. Yes. Okay. Elsewhere, about 25% of, of uh, mining is being done On an average, nearly 25% of copper production of the world is by bioleaching process. Bioleaching. You switched over to uh, another area which was coming up, which yes. is called nanotechnology. Yeah. Uh, how did that switch over come about? Actually, I was a visiting professor in, in a, at a university in France, in Strasbourg. This university is called Louis Pasteur University. And Purely by accident, I, I met a, a, a Nobel laureate. Uh, his name is Jean Marie Len. He's a chemist. He's, he got his, his uh, Nobel Prize in supramolecular chemistry. And I, I got an opportunity to discuss my work with him. And I was explaining him about uh, my work on me metal microbe interactions. So he asked me a question which was uh, very simple at that time. I mean, uh, I thought it was very simple. He, say, he said, do your my microbes, can, can they produce any uh, metal nanoparticles? And at that time, I didn't know anything about nanotechnology. So I started reading about it and I realized that actually microbes, many microbes produce nanoparticles, but only we didn't say, we didn't know that they should be called as nanoparticles. For example, there are uh, bacteria which are called as magnetotactic bacteria. They are present in all water bodies of the earth and they are known to uh, swim along the magnetic lines of the Earth. And this is because they have a small chain of magnetite particles inside the cells. So these, this was my first revelation that, that yes, microbes can produce metal nanoparticles. And then I started a very systematic program of uh, finding out uh, whether uh, microbes can be used for producing metal nanoparticles. And 
a whole new science came up uh, through that work. And it was a successful yes. story yes. Uh, over a period of about yes. 20 years. Yes. Don't go anywhere. I have to take a break, but we'll come back soon. The discussion will continue. Welcome back. Uh, we were discussing that how the technology is today based on not only basic and fundamental research, but also the walls, the straight jacketed walls between yes. disciplines have cracked. And you have switched over from biology to metallurgy to nanotechnology. Uh, when you were working on the problem of ground water, mm -hmm. um, there is a story associated with it. Yes. What you saw in Bangladesh, yeah. and then you came back to India and started. Would you in, like in to fact, tell us something? That was another switch uh, which happened between I, before I shifted to nanotechnology. Right. I met uh, uh, one professor Deepanka Chakrabarti from Jadapur University in 1995. He was working on groundwater arsenic problem, and with him I went to Bangladesh and went to some villages where I saw some horrendous pictures. Many people uh, who have amputated legs. And this because was of arsenic, because of uh, the arsenic poisoning. poisoning. And I was really moved by those uh, visits. So I decided to work on this problem. Because so far, till that time, I had to work on extracting metals from ores. So I decided also to work on extracting metals from uh, waters, soluble metals from waters. And that's how we actually developed a technology, which is again a microbial technology for extracting arsenic uh, from water. And the we deployed same it in, knowledge yeah. that you gained yes. during your training right. could be used for something very different. And now you are entering into the area of health yes, rather than physics or chemistry. Once I shifted to nanotechnology, I think uh, it was a, uh, I mean, it's a, such a all-encompassing technology that uh, we had to choose in which areas we should focus on. So, so for our group, we are now focusing on applications in medicine, agriculture, and environmental science. So these are coming together. Yes. And the institute yes. is the Agarkar Institute, yes. where yes. which you are heading, yes. is focusing in these areas, yes. which are of direct interest to the nation and the right. common citizen. You have been working also in the area of health later on when you switched over to. Would you like to say something about that? Yeah, actually. Um, uh, as, as our work in nanotechnology progressed, we actually uh, invented a process for extra, uh, metal, making silver nanoparticles using bacteria. And then uh, we realized that bacteria actually use a very ingenious method of uh, keeping these nanoparticles apart in unagglomerated conditions. When bacteria synthesize these nanoparticles, they put a small coating of some peptide or some biomolecule around the nanoparticles. Okay. And so we, we actually copied this wisdom from bacteria and we have taken patents on a process which is called as biostabilization of nanoparticles. And now this, is, this has become a real uh, platform technology for all our work. So we have developed a product uh, in association with a uh, pharma company in Mumbai, Khandelwal Laboratories. This is a product uh, using sil silver nanoparticles, biostabilized silver nanoparticles. And we made a, a gel, silver gel. This is for treatment of burn wounds, diabetic ulcers, and bed sores. The product has come out in the market very recently. Before that, he, it has passed through all the stages of development, uh, including phase one trials and phase three trials, phase one, phase one, phase two, phase three trials, clinical trials in the patients. So it is a long journey. But finally, it has come to the market and it is picking up the market. Uh, it's a very popular, very popular thing. Product. Would you like to show that? These are the two products. Uh, this is a silver gel. Right. Uh, it's called S-Gel. It is being marketed under two na brand names. This has been completely developed by your institute. Completely developed by our institute. And it's better than the other ones which are available. Yes. Uh, how do you compare them and why it's better than? Uh, because, see, silver is nothing new. Silver we have been using as antimicrobial for years together, for, for many uh, thousands of years, in fact. We use silver utensils, for example, Correct. Uh, to store water. This is basically for this. But here, 
we have used these silver nanoparticles and our study shows that uh, the nanoparticles actually break down any bacterial cells into pieces. It's kind of a physical destruction in addition to known mechanisms where people claim that... So you are, think yeah. as a scientist mm -hmm. that this cannot uh, develop resistance Yes. Uh, in bacteria. I would think so that it will be very difficult to develop resistance against bacteria, against silver nanoparticles yeah. by the bacteria. By the bacteria. So yeah. it is going to be a very stable yes. remedy yes. for burns and yes. other yes. ailments. Your work mm -hmm. started with biology and now comes back to full circle to biology once again. Yes. Right from physics to nanotechnology to engineering to other areas. It has been a very satisfactory probably journey yes. for you. You have produced a large number of uh, papers and uh, have citation which runs into about 4,000. Uh, are you satisfied with the recognition that you have got and uh, your team has got and your institute has got? Yes. Uh, actually, it has been a very gratifying journey for me because uh, I have worked on mainly application area, application oriented research and many of these technologies we are able to, we were able to transfer to industries. Unfortunately, many, many technologies couldn't go beyond a certain point, but still, uh, I think uh, if we uh, pursue uh, properly, there is a lot of scope of taking many of our technologies into, into marketplace. And something which goes uh, in the market and useful to the common people, uh, it, it really gives you satisfaction. But that cannot be done without basic research and fundamental course, research. Yes, yes. You have to invest a lot of money yes. because there is always a, an argument that why you spend so much on... As narrated the story of this, uh, how we produce silver nanoparticles in bacteria and then this was a basic research which got translated into a product. So I think fundamental research or basic... As a research nation, we should keep on f our focus on basic and fundamental research. Yes, yes. We cannot shift from Obviously. there. Now, would you like to give uh, a message to the younger generation? Uh, I would like to tell you two things. One uh, is that it is important to uh, work in an interdisciplinary field. You cannot compartmentalize yourself only into one area. Nature has not compartmentalized Nature, knowledge. Yes, yes. So we shouldn't. We shouldn't. So one must have an open mind. Open mind is important. And scientific temper. Yes. Open mind works like a parachute. When it is mind is open, then only uh, actually you can, uh, it lands properly. This parachute will land properly. <laughs> if the mind is open, yeah. which is like a parachute, it yeah. lands properly. That is the message we take back home. May I on your behalf promise our viewers that you will be happy to answer questions if they have? Sure, sure. So write to us if you have any question or comment. Our email address is eurekarstv at gmail.com. We'll be back next week with another scientist who has excelled in an area and has made significant contribution. Till then, goodbye. Thank you for giving us Thank so much you. of time. It was great.